ಸ್ಥಾಪಕಾಯ ಧರ್ಮಸ್ವರೂಪಿಣೆ ಸ್ಥಾಪಕಾಯ ಧರ್ಮಸ್ವರೂಪಿಣೆ ಅವತಾರವರಿಷ್ಠ ರಾಮಕೃಷ್ಣಾಯತೆ ನಮಃ ಹಸೋ ಮಾಸದ್ಗಮಯ ತಮಸೋ ಮಾಜೋತ್ಗಮಯ ಪ್ರತ್ಯೋರ್ಮೃತಂಗಮಯ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 let us offer our salutations to shri ramakrishna the embodiment of all religions the supreme god incarnate who came to establish universal religion let us pray to him to lead us from the unreal to the real to lead us from the darkness of ignorance to the light of knowledge to lead us from death to immortality before commencing my discourse today you know we have recently heard that a devastating uh, distress occurred in some parts of indonesia india and sri lanka malaysia several thousands of people became victims of the nature's fury anyway nothing is in our hands what best we can do is to offer our prayers for all these unfortunate beings who had immature death so please all of you stand for a minute we shall offer our silent prayers and we shall invoke the mercy of god to grant peace and happiness to the families of the victims and also peace to the departed souls Shanti Peace, peace, peace be unto all Please be seated Today's topic I am speaking on the importance of life How it is very important and how strange we have not taken any precaution to learn the importance of life life is not a joke it doesn't come accidentally god has divine plans for life and there are so many types of lives plant life animal life visible life invisible life spirit life varieties infinite types of lives are there but then there is definitely a purpose behind all this play the purpose is to know the truth to realize the mystery behind this life so 
so we have to ponder over on the topic what is life first of all is it merely the act of breathing or respiration or digestion or excretion or the acts of metabolism anabolism catabolism the constructive or destructive changes that ever go on in the physical organism or human body or economy of nature is it mere thinking or planning or scheming to earn money or name and fame is it the act of procreation to keep up the line is it the sum total of all these processes or is it the movement of protoplasm in the in the unicellular organism amoeba which is single nucleus scientists and biologists have a different conception of life philosophers like shankaracharya have quite a different conception of life life is of two kinds life in matter and life in the atman or the spirit or pure consciousness biologists physiologists and psychologists hold that life consists of thinking feeling knowing willing digestion excretion circulation respiration etc this kind of life is not everlasting this is attained with dangers pains fear cares anxieties worries exertion sin birth and death with their concomitant evils namely old age diseases etc therefore sages and seers rishis prophets and saints who have realized their inner self by discipline of the mind and the organs by tyaga and tapas by vairagya and abhyasa by leading a life of self denial self sacrifice and self abnegation have emphatically without a shadow of doubt like an amalaka fruit in the hand declared that a life in the atman or pure self alone can bring everlasting peace infinite bliss supreme joy eternal satisfaction and immortality they have prescribed various definite methods for self realization according to various temperaments capacities and tastes of individuals those who have implicit faith in their teachings in the vedas and in the words of the guru or spiritual preceptor march fearlessly in the field of spirituality or truth and obtain freedom or perfection or salvation they don't come back to this mortal world they rest in sachidananda brahman or their own swarupa this is the goal of human life this is the highest aim of life this is the final destination which bears various names as nirvana paramagati param dharm brahmasthiti self realization and so on it is your highest duty this does not mean however that we should ignore the life in the physical plane of matter matter is the expression of god or brahman for his own sport matter and spirit are inseparable like heat and fire cold and ice and flower and fragrance shakti the power and shatta he who possesses power are one brahman and maya are inseparable and one a life in the physical plane is a different preparation for the eternal life in brahman world is your best teacher 
the five elements are your gurus nature is your mother and director prakriti is your silent master world is the best training ground for the development of various divine virtues such as mercy forgiveness tolerance universal love generosity nobility courage magnanimity patience will power and so on world is an arena for fighting with the diabolical nature and for expressing divinity from within the central teaching of the bhagavad gita and yoga vasishta is that one should realize his self by remaining in the world be in the world but be out of the world that's the technique behave like the water on the lotus leaf give up the lower asuric nature which consists of selfishness lust anger and greed hatred and jealousy and assert the divine nature a life of mental renunciation and self sacrifice is there not a nobler mission in life than eating drinking and sleeping it is difficult to get a human birth it is said in our scriptures it is said by our saints and sages that human life is got after millions of various types of births with various types of forms therefore try your best to realize this birth this human birth is most precious and most auspicious time sweeps away kings and barons where is yudhishthir where is ashoka where is valmiki where is shakespeare where is napoleon therefore be up and doing in yogic sadhan and you will enjoy supreme bliss can you expect real shanti if you waste your time in hunting after the momentary pleasures of the senses and this worldly life can you enjoy real happiness if you waste your time in fights and quarrels or in idle gossiping then what's the meaning of living then to live is therefore to fight for the ideal and goal life is conquest it is a series of awakenings conquer your mind and the senses these are the real enemies conquer your internal and external nature you must conquer your environments you must conquer your old evil habits old evil samskaras old evil thoughts and evil vasanas you must fight against the antagonistic dark evil forces you must resist the forces of degeneration this life is meant for self realization so do regular sankirtan and realize the atmic bliss do nishkam karm selfless activity and purify your heart and mind control the indriyas and rest in your own swarupa when you get knocks and blows in the daily battle of life the mind is duly turned towards the spiritual path then come viveka vairagya disgust for worldly things and desire for liberation practice deep meditation life is short time is fleeting this world is full of miseries cut the knot of avidya and drink deep the nectar of nirvanic bliss spiritual life is not mere idle talk it is not mere sensation it is a transcendental experience of unalloyed joy and bliss it is a life of fullness and perfection there is a place of eternal peace and infinite bliss where there is neither death nor desire neither sorrow nor pain neither doubt nor delusion do you not aspire to reach this immortal abode of perennial joy and happiness discipline the mind and the senses cultivate noble virtues try to know the nature of the soul 
practice regular meditation on the self. Then alone you will attain immortality and deep abiding joy. Then alone you will reach the immortal abode. Give up identification of yourself with the physical body. Identification of oneself with the body is the greatest crime. Give up planning and scheming. Abandon speculation. Relinquish cherished hopes and expectations and worldly ambitions. Kill desires. Raise above desires. Live intelligently. Study the Upanishads thoroughly. Meditate regularly. Come out of the dungeon of ignorance. Bask in the glorious sunshine of Brahman. Share this knowledge with others. You are swayed by unholy desires and avidya. Self-realization is the goal of life. This is the end and aim of life of human existence. Wake up from the dream of forms. Give up this clinging to false names and forms. Don't be deceived by these illusory names and forms. Cling to this solid, living reality only. Love your Atman only. Atman or Brahman is the living truth. Atman only persists. Live in the Atman. Become Brahman. This is real life. The practice of Karma Yoga prepares the mind of the aspirant for the reception of the knowledge of the Self. It moulds him into a proper adhikari or aspirant for the study of the Vedanta. Ignorant people jump at once to the practice of Jnana Yoga without having any preliminary training in Karma Yoga. That's why they fail miserably to realize the truth. The impurities, the impurities still lurk in their minds. The mind is filled with likes and dislikes. They only talk of Brahman. They indulge in all sorts of useless discussions vain debates and dry endless controversies. Their philosophy is on their lips only. In other words, they are lip Vedantins. What is wanted is practical Vedanta. Through ceaseless selfless service of the country and humanity, in some form or other, with Atma Bhava, kindle the light of love in our heart, love everyone, link Include all creatures in the warm embrace of your love. Cultivate Vishwa Prem or all embracing, all inclusive cosmic love. Love is mysterious divine glue that unites, that unites the hearts of all. It's a divine magical healing balm of a very high potency. Charge every action with pure love. Kill cunningness, greed, crookedness and selfishness. The immortal can be attained only by performing acts of kindness continuously. Hatred and anger and jealousy are removed by continuous service with a loving heart. You will get more strength, more joy and more satisfaction by doing kind acts. You will be loved by all. Practice of compassion, charitable acts and kind service purify and soften the heart. Turn the heart lotus upwards and prepare the aspirant for the reception of divine light. About the purpose of this human life, all the great saints have declared the most significant purpose of this life. Swami Brahmananda Ji, one of the spiritual giants, disciples of Sri Ramakrishna, has said, the one purpose of life is to know God. Plunge deep into the sea of bliss and become immortal. Attain knowledge and devotion, then serve God in mankind. Sri Ramakrishna's life is a glowing example to show us. Sri Ramakrishna himself would say, the purpose of human life is to realize truth. First let me realize the truth and then everything will follow. The one purpose of human life is to attain devotion to God and spiritual illumination. That means the purpose of human life is to live a life of spirituality. Otherwise life is vain and meaningless. Eating, drinking, sleeping and procreating 
are not the sole ends of human birth. These belong to the brutes. How blessed is the human birth. Man alone can find God. None else, not even the angels in the heavens, can realize the truth. To realize God must be man's only purpose. Strive hard to reach Him and be free in this very life. The one purpose of life is to know God, learn to be absorbed in Him, be firmly convinced that realize Him, to realize Him is the only purpose of life. Eat the mangoes, do not count the leaves. The sole purpose of life is to reach God, reach Him first. Another direct disciple of Sri Ramakrishna, Shivananduji, used to say, the only purpose of life is to realize God, no matter whether sons and wife remain or go. Whatever you may do, you know this, my child, that the one purpose of life is to realize God. This world is short-lived and evanescent. God alone is the abiding reality. Swami Thibunathitananda, another disciple, said, when that self will be realized, one will find it present everywhere. And that is one's highest achievement. One's purpose in life is to attain that state. Swami Abhayathanandaji said, The real purpose of life is to gain self-knowledge. Life is not meant for a discussion as to whether virtue or vice exists. Swami Shardananda said, you have come to the world to realize God. That is the sole purpose of life. It has no other end. The only purpose of life is to have a direct vision of Him. Try to know this. Then the mind will never again be shaken by the glamour of name, fame and power. Only then the mind will be safe from, from the clutches of lust and gold. What more to write? Become His through and through. Swami Akhandananji said, One's purpose of life is to attain that state, realization of the Self. Everyone must actualize that experience in life, for that is one's real nature. The importance of life is in achieving the Purusharthas. What are the Purusharthas? They are well defined in our scriptures. Purush means human being, Artha means object or objective. Purusharthas means objectives of man. According to Hindu way of life, a man should strive to achieve four chief objectives in his life. They are dharma, righteousness, artha, wealth, karma, desire, and moksha, salvation. Every individual in a society he is expected to achieve these four objectives and seek fulfillment in his life before departing from here. The concept of Purusharthas clearly establishes the fact that Hinduism doesn't advocate a life of self-negation and hardship but a life of balance, achievement and fulfillment. First, Dharma. Dharma is a very complicated word for which there is no equivalent word in any other language, including English. Dharma actually means that which upholds this entire creation. It is a divine law that is inherent and invisible, but responsible for all existence. Dharma exists in all planes, in all aspects and all levels of creation. In the context of human life, Dharma consists of all that an individual undertakes in harmony with Divine, with Divine expectations and his own inner spiritual aspirations, actions that would ensure order and harmony within himself and in the environment in which he lives. Since this world is deluded, a human being may not know what is right and what is wrong or what is Dharma and what is Adharma. Hence he should rely upon the scriptures and adhere to the injunctions contained therein. In short, dharma for a human being means developing divine virtues 
and performing actions that are in harmony with divine laws dharma is considered to be f- the first cardinal aim because it is at the root of everything and upholds everything for example see what happens when a person amasses wealth without observing dharma or indulges in sexual passion against the social norms are established in moral values any action performed without observing dharma is bound to bring misery and suffering and delay one's salvation hinduism therefore considers it rightly as the first cardinal aim of life in ancient india dharma shastras provided guidance to people in their day to day lives and helped them to adhere to dharma these law books were written for a spec for a particular time for a particular time frame and are no more relevant to the modern world the best way to know what is dharma and what is adharma is to follow the religious scriptures such as the bhagavad gita and the upanishads or any other scripture that contains the words of god so much about dharma then comes artha artha means wealth Hinduism recognizes the importance of material wealth for the overall happiness and well-being of an individual. A householder requires wealth because he has to perform many duties to uphold dharma and ensure the welfare and progress of his family and society. A person may have the intention to uphold the dharma, but if he has no money, he would not be able to perform his duties and fulfill his dharma. Hinduism therefore rightly places material wealth as the second most important objective in human life. Lord Vishnu is the best example for any householder who wants to lead a life of luxury and still be on the side of God doing his duties. As the preserver of the universe, Lord Vishnu lives in Vaikuntha amid pomp and glory with the goddess of wealth herself by his side and yet helps the poor and the needy protects the weak upholds the dharma and sometimes leaving everything aside rushes to the earth as an incarnation to uphold dharma hinduism advocates austerity simplicity and detachment but does not glorify poverty hinduism also emphasizes the need to observe dharma well amassing the wealth poverty has become a grotesque reality in present day hindu society Hindus have become so poverty conscious that if a saint or a sage leads a comfortable life, they scoff at him, saying that he is not a true yogi. They have to remind themselves of the simple fact that none of the Hindu gods and goddesses are really poor. Hinduism believes that both spiritualism and materialism are important for the salvation of human beings. It is unfortunate that Hinduism came to be associated more with spiritualism probably because of the influence of Buddhism whereas in truth Hinduism doesn't exclude either of them as Swami Vivekananda rightly said religion is not for the empty stomachs religion is not for those whose main concern for morning till evening is how to make both ends meet poverty crushes the spirit of man and renders him an easy prey to wicked forces in ancient india artha shastras scriptures on wealth provided necessary guidance to people on the finer aspects of managing their wealth kautilya's artha shastra which is probably a compilation of many independent works gives us a glimpse of how many money matters were handled in ancient india the third purushartha is kama kama in a wider sense means desire and in a narrow sense sexual desire hinduism prescribes fulfillment of sexual passions for the householders and abstinence from it for the students and ascetics who are engaged in the study of the scriptures and in the pursuit of brahman the bhagavad gita informs us that desire is an aspect of delusion and one has to be wary of its various movements and manifestations the best way to deal with desires is to develop detachment and perform desireless actions 
without seeking the fruit of one's actions and making an offering of all the actions to God. This way our actions would not bind us to the cycle of births and deaths. Hinduism permits sexual freedom so long as it is not in conflict with the first aim that is dharma. Hindu scriptures emphasize that the purpose of sex is of procreation and perpetuation of family and society while the purpose of dharma is to ensure order in the institution of family and society. A householder has the permission to indulge in sex but also has the responsibility to pursue it in accordance with the laws of dharma. Marriage is recognized as a social institution and marriage with wife for the purpose of producing children is legitimate and in line with the aims of dharma. Sex in any other form including sex with wife for pleasure is a dharma. Here we are explaining the logic of the Purusharthas. We are not advocating an opinion. One of the important sects of Hinduism is Tantricism. It recognizes the importance of sexual freedom in the liberation of soul. The Tantrics accept sex as an important means to experience the blissful nature of God and the best way to experience God in physical form. They also refer to the concept of Purusharthas to justify their doctrines. They believe that sexual energy is divine energy and it can be transformed into spiritual energy through controlled expression of sex. Just as the Dharma Shastras were written for the sake of Dharma and the Artha Shastras for the Artha, Kama Shastras were composed in ancient India for providing guidance in matters of sex. We have lost many of them because of the extreme secrecy and social disapproval associated with the subject. What we have today is Vatsayana's Kama Sutra, which like the Artha Shastra seems to be a compilation of various independent works, rather the work of a single individual. Next comes Moksha, the last Purusharta. If dharma guides the life of a human being from below acting as the earth, showing him the way from above like a star studded mysterious sky is moksha. Dharma constitutes the legs of a purusha that walk upon the earth. Both artha and kama constitute his two limbs active in the middle region while moksha constitutes the head that rests in the heaven. Human life is very precious because of all the beings in all the worlds, only human beings have the best opportunity to realize the higher self. It is also precious because it is attained after many hundreds and thousands of lives. Rightly, salvation should be its ultimate aim. Moksha actually means absence of moha or delusion. Delusion is caused by the interplay of the triple gunas, satvarajas and tamas. When a person overcomes these gunas, he attains liberation. The gunas can be overcome by detachment, self-control, surrender to God and offering one's actions to God. If dharma is the center of the wheel of human life, artha and kama are the two spokes and moksha is its circumference. If dharma is at the center of human life, beyond moksha there is no human life but only a life divine. The four purusharthas are also like the four wheels of a chariot called human life. They collectively uphold it and lead it. Each influences the movement of the other three and in the absence of any one of them the chariot comes to a halt. Now what is the logic behind the concept of karma? That is very important for us to know. In simple terms the law of karma suggests that a person's mental and physical actions determine the progress of his life on earth. Whatever actions he undertakes, both his good and bad actions, impact his life in several ways and bring twists and turns in the course of his life. His bad actions lead him to suffering and unhappiness, while his good actions lead him to happiness and spiritual success. There is a verifiable logic no convincing proof other than our own experiences is required 
to prove that we reap as we sow for example if a student prepares well for his exams very likely he will get good marks and succeed but if he ignores studies the chances are he will fail sometimes despite of all the good work and sincere intentions the opposite may also happen a student may prepare well for his exam and may fail a very evil and wicked person may earn the jackpot our ordinary logic and intellect cannot explain these events but karma theory can according to the concept of karma the events in our lives need not be determined by our actions in this life but also by the actions that we did in our previous lives this explains why an evil person sometimes seems to succeed and amass wealth while a good hearted soul may be passing through adversity although the logic behind the concept of karma is quite logical and convincing it also leaves us with anxiety because we all know that it is not always possible to perform good actions besides we may not even know what consequences our actions would lead to some of our actions may prove harmful to others while we may think otherwise in these circumstances how are we supposed to conduct ourselves should we stop all action because every action will have some negative impact at some level lord krishna in the bhagavad gita provides us with a convincing answer in this regard he informs us that even if a man wants to stop all actions it would not be possible because living itself is an action oriented process so the best way to undertake actions is to perform them without desire and without attachments actions performed with desire with attachment for a selfish purpose and egoism would lead to bondage and suffering while actions performed without desire without attachment and actions done in the name of god for the sake of god and as offerings to god without desiring the fruit of such actions would lead to stability of mind and liberation from the cycle of births and deaths the teachings of the bhagavad gita about karma are not mere philosophical speculations the scripture has invaluable and practical lessons on human behavior and psychology it tells us how to live in peace amidst intense activity and how to keep our calm and saintly in a disturbing environment karma is the law of action the gita doesn't preach renunciation of action but renunciation of attachment to action and desire for its fruit it advocates both performance of action through knowledge and sanyasa as means for attainment of freedom from the consequences of one's actions sanyas means renunciation of action prompted by desire while tyaga means abandonment of the fruit of action both these are characteristic of a true karma yogi the true sanyasi is one who does his work without seeking the fruit of his actions not the one who gives up activity for the sacred fire if actions are performed with desire and attachment and with egoistic assumption of doership then one has to assume responsibility for all his actions and also face the consequences of all his actions here and hereafter he must enjoy or suffer from the fruits of his good actions as well as bad actions accepting either sorrow and suffering or pleasure and happiness emanating from his actions in both cases there is no real freedom from the laws and the jaws of mortal life he has to subjugate himself to the conditions of mortal life and remain confined to the world of illusion and ignorance it is impossible for one to remain inactive even for a moment or escape from action altogether the gunas born of nature drive everyone coercively to ceaseless activity freedom from action cannot be achieved by avoiding action or by mere renunciation of action he who engages himself in mere meditative practices restraining his organs of action is but deluded soul and a hypocrite by desisting from action it is not possible to maintain even one's body 
Even the imperishable supreme Brahman does his work dutifully, although he has no desire either to perform the actions or for the fruits of his actions. There is nothing in the three worlds for him to do, not is there anything that he is yet to attain. Still he engages himself in action. For if he does not do so, men would take him as an example and would avoid, and would avoid actions. So the true aspirant who wants to attain union with him should also follow the same path while performing his actions. He must do his enjoined duty without attachment, without any interest whatsoever, either in what is done or what is not done, knowing that his right is to work only, but not to the fruit thereof. Even minded in success and failure, surrendering to God and offering the fruit of actions to God, and partaking of only that which has been offered to him. Actions that are performed with egoism, thinking that one is the doer with a desire to enjoy the fruit of his actions, bind man to bondage and delusion. He who thinks that he is the doer of his actions, he is but a deluded soul who does not know the truth about the spheres of gunas and how they are responsible for all binding actions. Performing actions out of desire and attachment with an intention to enjoy the fruit of his actions, such a deluded soul has but to face the consequences of his own actions, both good and the bad. Depending upon the nature of his activities, he may gain either sorrow or happiness in this world, or heavenly worlds, or hellish realms hereafter. The enlightened karma yogi, on the other hand, knows what is action in action, and inaction in action. He knows who is the real doer and how the gunas drive, you, drive men to perform actions and how such actions bind men to sorrow and suffering. When he performs his actions, he is aware that it is only the senses which are occupied with the object of his senses and thereby remains unconcerned. Thus he actually becomes inactive even while performing actions and remains untouched by the fruits of his actions like the lotus leaf by water. Karma Yoga or the Yoga of Action is based upon the following principles. The first principle is man cannot escape from performing actions however he may live therefore man should not renounce actions. Second, the True renunciation means renunciation of the desire for the fruit of one's action, not the action itself. Third, the deluded man thinks egoistically that I am the doer, not realizing that it is nature which engages men in actions through the triple gunas of sattva, rajas and tamas, purity, passion and crudeness. Fourth, Actions that are performed out of desire for the fruit of action and with a sense of doership bind men to the mortal world. Fifth, in performing actions, one should follow the example of God who engages himself in actions, though there is nothing for him to do or achieve in all the worlds. To become perfect in Karma Yoga, a devotee should approach men of knowledge prostrate before them and know from them what is action and what is inaction. You should also cultivate the following qualities or virtues. One, detachment. Secondly, equanimity of the mind. Third, elimination or control of desires, especially desire for the fruit of his actions. Four, surrender to God. Five, egolessness. Six, single-minded devotion to God. Karma Yoga, the path of action suggested in the Gita, teaches an individual how to remain amidst the world, performing his duties and still qualify himself for spiritual life. This is in stark contrast to the traditional opinion given in some of the Upanishads that man should renounce his worldly life, go to some forest or secluded place, away from society like a cave and perform tapas or meditation. This is again in contrast to the Vedic concept that in the third stage of human life called the phase of forest life, vanaprastha, 
man should leave behind his family and household responsibilities and go to the forest with his wife and live there in the contemplation of god man does not attain freedom by abstaining from work or by renouncing work it is not possible for anyone to remain inactive even for a moment as the gunas drive everyone hopelessly to perform actions action is superior to inaction without action even the manifest even the maintenance of the body is not truly possible the body needs food for its survival food comes from god only the virtuous ones who know this eat only that which has been offered to god as a sacrifice for the sake of nourishing their bodies alone by doing so they do not incur any sin in this path of action there is no loss nor any reverse act reaction even a little practice safeguards one from the fear of birth and death according to the gita man's right is to work only but not to the fruits of his actions or to inaction true karma yoga consists of performing one's duty without attachment and remaining even minded in success and failure this can be accomplished by controlling the senses and the desires a true karma yogi knows that controlling the senses is very important he therefore engages in actions by restraining his mind and the senses unattached directing his organs to work he overcomes this way of he overcomes in this way desires and is self contented taking nor does he depend upon anyone for anything he thus performs his duty without attachment even the lord supreme is true karma yogi for he also engages himself in actions though there is nothing in the three worlds for him to do or attain he performs actions so that men would follow his example and also that worlds could be saved from disorder and confusion the ignorant acts with selfish motives and with attachment while the wise act without attachment for the general welfare of the world the sense of doership is another area of internal reform the knower of the gunas knows that all actions are caused by the triple qualities of nature and therefore he remains detached he surrenders all his actions to god with his mind fixed on him freed from expectations attachment and mental agitations it is not restraint of actions but restraint of the senses which is important even if the duty is of imperfect nature one should not abandon it and take up a new one for however imperfect the duty may be real fulfillment comes only by performing one's duty but not by avoiding it desire is the eternal enemy of the wise on earth the insatiable fire which deludes the soul by overpowering the senses the mind and the intellect the true karma yogi therefore controls his senses and desires through wisdom and discipline and engages himself in desireless actions renunciation of actions with knowledge is described in the fourth chapter of the bhagavad gita the supreme knowledge of renouncing actions through knowledge was explained to many great souls in the past but it was said to have been lost in the course of time and lord krishna unraveled the secret once again and explained it to the arjun his beloved disciple renunciation of action through knowledge means becoming free from the bondage of actions by knowing the truth about actions knowing what is action what is inaction and also what is a prohibited action by knowing this the wise karma yogi learns to see inaction in action and action in inaction the first step in this direction is to learn from the example of god himself by knowing how he actually engages himself in action though he is unborn and eternal god incarnates on earth to restore order and balance whenever disorder and confusion becomes excessive he does this to protect the pious and destroy the wicked those who know the divine birth and actions of god are freed from cycles of births and death by the fire of knowledge of the divine they, they attain his being the fourfold order in society 
was also created by God. Again, out of no desire, but to establish order in the world. The ancient seers knew that actions would not taint God as he had no desire for the fruits of actions. Thus, by knowledge, they attained perfection. After knowing the truth about action, with the help of knowledge so gained, a man of wisdom engages himself in actions that do not bind him. How does he achieve this? The answer can be found in the fourth chapter. He renounces attachment to actions. You are content without any shelter, without any expectations, mind and self under control, giving up all possessions, performing only body related functions. He is happy with whatever that comes to him on its own, free from jealousy, beyond dualities, equal in success and failure. With all attachments gone, mind established in wisdom, his actions become equal to acts of sacrifice and he is completely liberated from the bondage of actions. Renunciation of actions through knowledge alone is very difficult to achieve, but it can be achieved easily by performing the actions. But one should know how to renounce actions by performing actions, not by avoiding them. A true sannyasi is one who does his work without depending upon the fruit of his actions, not the one who gives up actions and sacrifice and not the one who gives up actions and sacred fire. It is not possible for the human beings to remain inactive even for a moment. Therefore no one except the deluded minds try to renounce actions by not performing them. What is to be renounced is not the action but the doership the attachment and the desire for the fruit of one's actions. This, according to Lord Krishna, is true renunciation. Therefore the karma yogi renounces his actions by offering them to God, shaking off all attachment and performing actions with his senses, mind, intellect and body only for the sake of purification of soul. He offers the fruit of his actions to God and thereby attains supreme peace. The qualities of a true sannyasi are described in the fifth chapter of the Gita. The true sannyasi mentally renounces all actions and thus happily in the city of nine gates. He looks with the same eye on all objects, scholarly but humble and undeluded in his approach. He rejoices not on getting what is pleasant, not depressed on obtaining what is unpleasant. He is unattached to the external world, always engaged in the contemplation of Brahman, identified himself with Brahman. He is self-controlled, having been able to withstand desire, anger, whilst in the body. He is delighted in himself and is illuminated with it. The true sannyasi does not engage himself in selfish actions, but in such actions which promote the welfare of the world. And how can this state be attained? By withdrawing from all external contacts with the gaze fixed on internally, with the gaze fixed innerly between the eyes, between the eyebrows, and the regulating the flow of prana and apana, prana and apana, the sage controls his senses, mind and intellect, overcomes desire, anger, and becomes forever free. We should know about spiritualism and how to lead a divine-centered life. Spiritualism is above religion, and the petty and narrow-minded thinking that separates man from man and divides the mankind into religious groups. Spiritualism is way beyond dogmatism, fundamentalism and obscurantism, which are still potent forces upon earth, causing manifold problems among nations and peoples. The need of the hour is spiritualism, not ritualism. People may be reluctant to accept this viewpoint but the need to understand that religions have outlived their purpose as propaganda missionary of Western interests and need a major shift in their spiritual outlook. Spiritualism is based upon three main tenets of our basic belief. One is the inner spirit is the only reality. Second, the inner self, which we call also as the higher self, is distinct and different from the outer self or the lower self, also known as the physical self. And thirdly, 
through the process of detachment and spiritual discipline. It is possible for us to detach ourselves from the outer self and discover the inner self that is hidden in all of us. So, life is a continuous struggle to rise from the human level to the divine level. All angularities have to be taken out before we can rise to the divine level. And it's only in this human life the opportunity is given for us to strive for raising ourselves to the divine level. So, this human life occupies most important place. We should give at most attention to the way of life and every moment of life is very important. It guides us our future course of life. So, we should first very strongly aspire for realizing the truth. To realize the inner self dwelling in the heart. In order to do that, one should conduct the life in a proper way, fully concentrating on the ways of doing things and completely believing the presence of the Divine. Everything happens by the Divine will. Even the movement of the blade of grass is by the will of God. So, we have seen in the recent devastated flood causing lots of deaths in some parts of Indonesia and India. Amidst all these horrible deaths, we have also seen how miraculously some children are saved. One baby is alive, twenty days old baby is alive. So, how did this could happen? That means there is some divine power operating on all these things. Anyway, according to law of karma, things happen according to the nature of the law. Everyone has to go through that law, whether we like them or not. But in the present scenario, what should we do? We should render our maximum service to the suffering people and show active sympathy in relieving their sorrows. That's the best way of offering our services to the bereaved families. In fact, we have planned also to raise sufficient fund for sending to Ramakrishna Mission in Belurmat, where we established four or five centers regulating the distribution of the relief. So the relief operation is actively going on from the day one and we have been receiving the reports also, we have published the report also, you can see in the notice board. And all of you are welcome to help for this uh, relief operation and all your checks will be exempted by tax and uh, all the amount will be sent to Belgamat for further action. So, life is very important, let us not ignore it, let us not live the life carelessly and indifferently, let us utilize this life thinking, this is the life which I have got opportunity, I must make best use of it. The best use of making this life is to live a life of dedicated self-sacrifice. Live for the sake of others. Do as much as you can. Be always giving. Be always helpful. With these words, we will be able to achieve the goal of our life, 
the realization of the truth, the mystery of this life. Thank you very much. Om Sahana Bhavato Sahana Ubunaktu Sahaviryam Karavai Tejasvinavadhi Damastoma Vidvishavai Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tatsat May the Lord protect us, may direct us May guide us, may nourish us, may we not be fruitful and enlightened, may we not hate each other, peace, peace, peace be unto all.